Cool. So let me just show you real quick what we have here. And this is going to be sort of a balancing act. <coughs> so get it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Unfortunately, all my puns are, uh, are accidental. OK, so we have here this pendulum. It can swing back and forth. There's an arm that can make it swing back and forth. And this is a little rotary encoder that can measure what is the angle of the pendulum here. And we'd like it to be balanced like this. So this is zero degrees. There's also another encoder. Let's see if we can do this. I watch, I drop this laptop and then I smash it into the. There's also another encoder down here. It's that little yellow thing behind the zip tie. See it? That little yellow circle? That's another encoder that tells you the angle of the arm, where the arm is pointing. And then lastly, there's this DC motor in here that, uh, that of course, drives the arm. And the whole idea is, of course, can you drive the arm in order to swing up the pendulum and then keep it up? So that's the whole idea behind the system. Now, it's been a little anemic, so I'm going to help it. It's a little robust. I can knock it back and forth a little bit. And then it gets into this limit cycle. OK, buddy. OK. Oh my God. It's supposed to look like this. Um, the, if you drive the motor with enough voltage, it can kick it up and then keep it up pretty well. And you can bat, around, bat it around a little bit, and it does OK. So that's the demo. Sorry it wasn't too great. You guys want to see it again? I mean, like, now that you know what to look for. OK. I mean, like, that's really kind of the highlight of the whole thing. So like, <laughs> the rest of it is just me, like, blah, blah, blah. All right. So, uh, so it actually runs two controllers. This one, one sec, Kyle. One, this one is just trying to pump energy into it to get it all the way up. And then once it gets up, it switches to a different controller whose only job is to keep it as far up yeah, at zero degrees as possible. And it runs for 20 seconds, and then it shuts itself down. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're dealing with in case you couldn't see the camera real well. So there's this rotary encoder that measures the angle of the pendulum. There's the motor that drives the arm back and forth. And there's a potentiometer that measures the angle of the arm. OK, so there's one input, the motor voltage, two outputs, the two angles, which are you know, physically in radians, but they're actually two different kinds of encoders. One of them is called a quadrature encoded pulse encoder, and I'll show you what that is in a second. And the other one's just a simple potentiometer. Like, you know, you could like, spin it with a dial, and it's essentially a, a voltage divider. But OK, so let's get into that hardware. Has anyone heard of quadrature encoded pulse stuff before? OK, so the, the idea is very simple. It's way simpler than it sounds because it sounds awful. But what the idea is, is if you were to take apart this tiny little black shell here, you would find a disk of plastic, of clear plastic, with radial uh, lines drawn on it, sort of like a DVD that you took a Sharpie to. And there's a little sensor that is just, all, it's a little photodiode that is paying attention to whether it's looking at a, you know, at a black line or whether it's a not black line. Um, and by counting the lines as they go by the sensor, it can count up the lines. It knows how many lines there are in one revolution. Um, and it can tell what is the angle. Now there's two, of these in co there's two of these sensors so that you can tell which direction it's going. Essentially, if, if the leading edge hits this one first, then it's going uh, clockwise, and if it's going, and if it hits this one first, then it's going counterclockwise. Does that make sense? So by positioning these two sensors appropriately, you can tell which direction it's going. So here's the animation. You can see the little ones and zeros are essentially, is it white or black? And this is the signal that comes out of the sensor. So there's actually two wires that come out of the sensor. Um, and when you're spinning this thing, uh, you see a square waves on both of those two wires. And the frequency of, those, of that square wave tells you essentially the angular velocity with which you're rotating the disk. So that's quadrature encoded pulse um, signals. Uh, and it comes up in a lot of places. Anytime you need to measure an angle, it's very convenient. The other thing is even simpler than that. It's just a potentiometer. So if you, you know, uh, there's three pins. If you tie this one to analog ground, this one to the analog rail, like 1.8 volts on the beagle bone, and put this one on the third pin, uh, and send this one to some analog to digital converter channel, um, the ADC, ADC channel zero or something, what that third pin will read is essentially it's a voltage divider. So if you've moved this little wiper all the way here, then V out will just be V. And if you move it all the way back down to here to ground, the V out will just be ground, zero. And anywhere in the middle will just be some, you know, it'll be a linear scale. So uh, that's, a way, that's another way of turning uh, a physical angle into something that you can read with a computer. 
Um, I should mention that the BeagleBone has analog inputs, so you can uh, very easily read this angle from a rotary encoder, uh, from a potentiometer, but if it's quadrature encoded pulses, you need something a little bit fancier. And in fact, one of the projects in ECE 153A, if I remember correctly, is to, is to essentially implement a, on an FPGA, I think, um, a program that will notice the rising and falling edges and be able to, to figure out the angle based on that. I didn't have to do that because um, the microprocessor on the BeagleBone has a, a QEP um, decoder built in. Very convenient. Okay. So that's the hardware. There's also a motor. It's uh, a lot bigger than this motor. This is just an example. But it's a coreless uh, DC motor. You can give it between like minus five and five volts. I think maybe even minus six to six volts. And essentially the speed of the motor is essentially uh, whatever voltage you're applying to the motor. Um, we drive it with a pulse width modulate, with a pulse width modulated signal. Has anybody heard of PWM before? A handful of people. We'll go into the details. We'll go. We'll gloss over the details of this. But the, essentially, the idea is, well, well, I have a nice plot of PWM. So that's the hardware of the BeagleBone. Um, sorry, that's the hardware of the Pendulum. And next, I want to talk about the BeagleBone. So this is a very big <laughs> BeagleBone Black. Um, it uh, you can buy it for about a hundred bucks in this like starter kit, it comes with a little breadboard and a bunch of pins and stuff. Um, they're about 50 bucks if you get sort of the minimal um, setup, which is just the BeagleBone and a little USB cable to plug it in. Um, it comes with, it has a bunch of stuff on it. Uh, don't bother trying to read all the details. I will just highlight for you that it has two gigs of onboard flash and it comes with Linux installed on it, some sort of Debian type distribution, I think. Um, so it has, it, you can, as soon as it boots up, it boots into Linux. It, there's a window manager, so there's like a nice GUI, you know, a nice interface. Um, very nice. It has a gigahertz processor on it that has a whole bunch of peripherals that we'll talk about later, but it's, it's reasonably snappy. And uh, it has half a gig of DDR RAM. So in many respects, this is like kind of a crappy computer, like a crappy desktop computer. And, uh, and that's pretty cool. You can run, um, you can run normal, you know, you can't run like, I don't know, what are the kids playing these days um, in terms of first person shooters? Titanfall. Sorry? Titanfall. Titanfall. Okay. Okay. I never heard of it. <laughs> when I was in school, it was like, uh, you know, Counter Strike. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. The oldies but goldies. Okay. So I don't know if you can play Counter Strike or Titanfall or whatever on this, but, but uh, I doubt it. Uh, but for our purposes, it has a bunch of peripherals that are really useful if you want to connect it to the real world. It has a nice serial debug header, so you can, like, if all, if everything goes completely to um, shit, you can uh, plug in a serial cable and see actually what is going on, you know, even if you have no, even if the video doesn't work or something. Um, in terms of peripherals, it has a bunch of general purpose IOs, inputs, output, inputs and outputs, uh, seven channel eight analog digital converter, and eight uh, PWM channels, as well as it can do um, SPI and I squared C. So it can interface to a lot of sensors and stuff. Um, and these highlighted ones are the ones that we're going to use for this project. So if you buy the super minimal version, it just comes with the BeagleBone and then the USB cable. And it's actually very interesting. It, it presents itself to your computer like a... Uh, well, not like, a, not like a flash drive, but it actually kind of installs a network on your computer and it runs a web server on that network so that as soon as you plug this in, and oh, by the way, it's powered by this too. So as soon as you plug this in, you can, on your host computer, like on my Mac, I can open, open up a browser and go to 192.168.7.2 and that's the BeagleBone and the BeagleBone hosts a web page that's this web page and then on this web page there's actually code examples written in this kind of cutesy code called BoneScript that you can execute and if you have JavaScript enabled on your browser that will execute code on the BeagleBone on the server on the BeagleBone and you can actually like turn LEDs on and off and play around with other pieces of the I.O. So that's, that's pretty cool. They, they, it was a huge design point that when they designed this thing, they wanted it, people to be able to plug it in and immediately start doing real world sort of interfacing stuff. I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty cool. Um, there are a lot of uh, IO stuff that's out there. So 
You, who's heard of an Arduino? <laughs> okay, everybody says functional hands. That was a gimme. Um, yeah, so I think I haven't played very much with Arduinos, but my understanding is that they have these like shields, these little circuit boards that you can plug into them. And this is, so a cape is the same thing as a shield. The idea is it's some sort of, you know, uh, board that you can plug into the beagle bone, and you know, you can get a screen, you can have it run on a battery, you can do it with connect a camera, uh, you know, you can do a lot of sort of hobby projects. So these things exist and you can, and they're designed by people like you and you can buy them and use them. So there's a, a nice ecosystem for that. Okay, but in terms of uh, getting stuff set up so that you can like um, write, like interface it with, with say Python or something, um, eventually you're gonna have to plug in sensors and stuff to these headers. And uh, it's, it's kind of complicated. This was, I struggled with this for a bit until I buckled down and just bought a book about it and then the book explained it great. But the idea here is that, you know, every one of these pins can be configured in a bunch of different ways because there's so many peripherals on this, mic on this uh, one gigahertz microprocessor. Um, each pin could be configured to be, you know, maybe it's the clock signal on the spy bus or maybe it's some general purpose IO that you're gonna use for something. And you use these things called device tree overlays in order to configure the pins however you want to. They have default, um, they have default uses, but if you need to use them for something else, uh, you can do that. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of the details but, but uh, on how you load a device tree overlay. But essentially what it kind of comes down to is, let's see, do I have a pointer? Otherwise I'm just going to jump around. At the top, um, you essentially have a directory that looks like it contains a bunch of files here, like a file called run and a file called duty and a file called uh, period. But those are actually not like real files. The kernel, the Linux kernel is paying attention to how you interact with these and is interfacing with the hardware on, on your behalf. So for example, if you echo some number into the duty file and then echo some number into the period file, and then echo one into the run file, that turns on the pulse width modulation at some period of like, I don't know, something like uh, a, a kilohertz with a duty cycle that is you know, 50, a 50% duty cycle or something. So this will start a square wave on pin, let's see, on, on the, eight, the P8 header on pin 34. And so if you jam an oscilloscope probe onto port eight, pin 34, you will see a square wave. Um, and if you echo maybe 1,000 into the duty file, instead of, instead of it being up half the time and down half the time, it will be up only a tenth of the time, because you did 1,000 and the period is 10,000. So you can sort of create a square wave that has you know, a different, different duty cycle um, using this, uh, this is called a sysfs, um, I don't know, I think this, this method of having a what appears to be a file, but then actually is a, a way of interacting with hardware is some sort of sysfs kind of file system thing. Okay, so that's uh, how from the shell, from bash, you could modify things in the, change things in the real world. Um, of course, we, we'd like to do this in like Python or something, so I'm getting to that. But of course, um, let's see, this was, a, this was a PWM example. Okay, so let me just describe PWM in just a, just a second. So, a DC motor needs to be given like a, a DC voltage. You know, it can, you, these ones can have between minus five and five volts applied. If you, go, if you go positive, it'll go clockwise. If you go negative, it'll go counterclockwise. And, uh, and if you do something in the middle, it'll go slower than full speed. Um, so it, ideally, the beagle bone would be able to output like some voltage that is in a continuous range from minus five to five volts. But because this is sort of a discrete component, uh, it doesn't have like a built-in digital to analog converter in it. So uh, instead, the way that you can do it is if you wanna go, let's see, if you wanna go at not full, you know, not full force, not full five volts, but you wanna go at two and a half volts, you can't put out a two and a half volt signal, you don't have digital to analog converter, but maybe you could put out a signal that is five volts half the time and zero volts half the time, so that the average is, is two and a half volts. And what you're sort of leveraging here is the fact that the motor can't spin instantaneously. So it's not like it's gonna go full speed stop, full speed stop. If you do it at like 50 kilohertz, if you have this like five volts, zero volts, five volts, zero volts at like 50 kilohertz, there's no way that it's gonna be able to spin, stop, spin, stop. It's, there's just, it's just too heavy. So that's how, that's how you use pulse width modulation to sort of simulate the ability to put out some voltage that is between zero volts and five volts, for instance. And if you want to get negative voltage, I'll show you how to do that too. Um, 
So, okay. The BeagleBone cannot power uh, a big old DC motor. It can't put that much current out. Um, the, it's sort of a delicate like little computer and if you want to drive like a real thing, like a big freaking motor, you need some sort of power electronics to do it. And so I bought one um, off of SparkFun. It's called a motor driver. And you know, here's sort of the input side, here's the output side. The input side takes a PWM signal um, and a couple of inputs that are tied to these two GPIO direction pins that tell you which way, which direction you're going to drive the thing. And then essentially an on-off switch. And so by by sending a you know maybe a 10% duty cycle through here and telling it, and setting this this pin high and this pin low, it will uh, essentially drive the motor at 10% uh, in in the clockwise direction. Okay, so essentially, I just this slide is here just to point out you cannot just drive a motor from the BeagleBone. You do need a little bit of of power electronics to to help you out. Okay. And you, you could drive it with like a battery if you wanted to, or you could just drive it with like a wall wart too. But I think for, because the, the motor windings on here, the resistance of, the, of this motor is something like two and a half ohms. If you put five volts through two and a half ohms, V over R is like two amps. And, and it's a little bit dicey whether your wall wart can put out uh, two amps continuous. Um, so anyway, uh, using a lead acid battery can help with that. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. That was just about PWM. So this is sort of the finished, finished product. <laughs> um, the, there's the motor driver, which has a bunch of pins that are like direction and the PWM signal. The output of the motor driver, this is the wall wart. This goes to the physical motor. Um, here is, here, this goes to the arm potentiometer. And then these wires just go to anal the analog rail, analog ground, and this is like analog channel zero. So this is just reading our little potentiometer. And then the QEP, the quadrature encoded pulse signal coming in from the pendulum encoder, is going through, well, let's see. This is a dangerous thing. This is a five volt signal coming in from the encoder. That's just what the encoder puts out. You have to step it down to 3.3 volts because that's the, the, the level at which the BeagleBones GPIOs operate. So you don't want to plug five volts into something that's only designed to take 3.3 volts. So you guys use a couple of transistors to, to essentially step it down to 3.3 volts. Um, use the five volt signal to switch the transistor that, and, the, and the, the uh, what is it called? The, the collector is going at 3.3 volts. Okay, so that's the hardware. Here's the software. Um, you essentially, there, Adafruit makes a library for BeagleBone input-output stuff that has modules like ADC, PWM, GPIO, and all you have to do is import these things into Python and define some pins, and then you can do things like GPIO setup and define this as an output GPIO uh, and set it low. For like the piece, pulse width modulation, you can tell it which pin you want to do PWM on, uh, and what frequency you want to operate at, like 50 kilohertz. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so this is pretty much how you set up um, the analog to digital converters, the GPIOs, and the PWM. And then the equip stuff, the quadrature encoded pulse stuff, um, at, in my version of the BeagleBone didn't support that, but um, I think they do now. So I had to get somebody's like, random library off GitHub for this. Okay, so once you have set up the... the um, the, the modules. You can read it just with adc.read, so that'll read your um, ADC channel, your analog digital uh, converter channels. And then this encoder object has a get position uh, method as well. When you want to write some voltage, if it's a positive voltage, you set out your GPIOs one way. If you, if you want to go negative, you set them the other way. And then you figure out the duty cycle based on how much of full scale the PWM is. So if you want to go four volts out of a five volt scale, this is four volts divided by five, so that's 80% times 100, so it's, uh, so it's 80. Okay, so that's how you set up the, uh, the reading and writing. So at this point, this, what we've talked about so far is enough that you could take this pendulum, please don't take the pendulum, you could take this pendulum, take the beagle bone, spend all summer <laughs> like I did, and wire up something that could drive the pendulum somehow. And what remains to be talked about is how do you, what sort of algorithm do you use with, if you have these inputs and you have this output, how do you figure out what the voltage should be as a function of the two inputs in order to swing it up and to balance it? So that's what the rest of this is going to be about. Okay? Cool. So this is the highest level that we could be talking about. 
there's a pendulum system, there's two outputs, the arm angle and the pendulum angle, that goes into some beagle bone black, and the output of that is some motor voltage that goes into the pendulum system. Um, and let's talk about linear systems. So this is a math, these are mathematical objects that are like the cornerstone of control theory because you can do a lot of interesting math with them and model a physical system with them pretty well. Okay, so let's talk about linear systems. So don't panic. <laughs> a discrete time linear time invariant system, dynamical system, is just a set of matrix equations of this form. So it's a uh, two equations, and each one of them, these, this thing is a vector and this thing is a vector, so these are really vector equations, that's okay, that just means every element's equal, uh, is, is a, you're establishing equality in every element. They are, it's discrete time, because these things are not changing over a continuum of time, but they're changing, the index here, i, is a natural number, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So it's not like t is a real number or something, you know, this is, this is a system that is only changing at discrete points in time. So that discrete time system. Um, it's time invariant because these matrices A, B, C, and D are not changing. They don't have subscripts. It's not C subscript I. They're constant. Only the state, the output, and the input are allowed to change with time. And when I say time here, I mean index, the I here. Okay. So the whole idea here is that you have some you have some equation that is telling you how is my state, this x here, going to change at the next time step as a function of, it, all, it, all, it, all it depends on is what was it at the previous time step and then what input did you apply? So for example, our state in our little pendulum system might be the arm angle, the arm angular velocity, so here's the arm angle, here's how fast is it going, here's the pendulum angle and the pendulum angular velocity. Those might be our four states. U might be our motor voltage that we're applying to the system. And, and there might be some relationship that if you knew the, the numeric values of these four things and you knew what motor voltage you applied, you could maybe plug those things in and if you knew, if you modeled the pendulum system as a discrete time linear system, there would be some A and B matrix that maybe you would have to find so that you could predict what would the state be in the next time step, in the next maybe five milliseconds later, what would the state be if, the, if you knew these numeric values and you plugged in and you applied three volts for five milliseconds. So that, that is the, the problem of finding the A and B matrices um, is, uh, is a big part of linear systems because that's, that's the thing that lets you predict what is the pendulum gonna do if it's here, if it's here and I apply this voltage, where is it gonna be five milliseconds later? So we'll talk a little bit about how to find those matrices, but that's the basic idea. Then this measurement equation down here, this output equation, the idea is Y is what you get to measure. So in our case, it's just the pendulum, uh, the arm angle and the pendulum angle. Um, those are the two measurements you get to make. We don't have measurements for the arm velocity and the pendulum velocity. Um, there are various ways that you can estimate them, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the idea here is, Let's see, if you are only measuring the arm angle and the pendulum angle, then this C matrix, which multiplies the state vector, is just this. It's this row, which picks off the arm angle, and this row, which picks out the pendulum angle. Does everybody remember linear algebra? You know how to multiply matrices and so on? Yep. Okay, so, and D here would be zero. There's no, there's no voltage that affects what you measure. I mean, not directly. It, it affects it through the state, but not directly. Okay, so C is this matrix, D is this matrix. We're gonna figure out A and B shortly, but the whole idea here is this is a mathematical thing. This does not necessarily have some sort of real world physical um, analog unless you give it one. So we are going to attempt to take the physics of the inverted pendulum and figure out A, B, C, and D matrices so that these equations hold and can predict what will the pendulum do um, at, say, five millisecond time steps? Yeah. So, um, if you decided that you wanted to estimate, um, like, the arm velocity, mm. uh, could you use, like, would you use the D matrix, maybe, and estimate the arm velocity based on the voltage you're currently providing to you could do that. You could try to figure out, and then it would be essentially in this like B matrix here that you would be attempting to uh, predict where the state would go if you didn't, if you weren't able to measure this. Or there's other ways, like you could store 
you could store the arm angle and the previous arm angle and then divide by delta t and that would be sort of a crappy derivative. Yeah, that would be another way to do it. And we'll talk about some other ways that involve something called a Kalman filter that maybe you've heard about. That's like one of the most important things in control theory um, is the Kalman filter. So one thing, one takeaway here, so two takeaways. If somebody gives you x0 um, and they tell you what voltages they applied, uh, you can calculate every x and every y just by plugging them into it. If you have a, b, c, and d, somebody says, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to give you x0 and I'm going to give you every single ui. You can just use this equation to get every single xi and then use this equation to get every single yi. So that sort of intuitively makes sense. If somebody says, I started here at x0 and I applied these voltages or whatever, and you know the system, a, b, c, and d, you can tell, you can predict what exactly the state will do and what you will measure. Okay, and so the whole point of control theory is, suppose you only get to observe y, can you figure out what u you should apply, what input you should apply to make the, the sequence of x's good in some sense? And typically, good means can you drive the state to zero or can you drive the state to some reference, like some reference signal. So for example, in the pendulum system, zero means the zero arm position, zero uh, pendulum position, like this is the zero angle, so this is 180, this is zero. Um, zero arm velocity, have it be still please, and zero pendulum velocity, have it be still. So this is uh, what we would like to drive the state to. Okay, so that's the whole idea with control theory. I only have a couple more sort of control theory slides. Actually, that's a lie. I have a few more. <laughs> but this is the basic idea of a linear system, is it's trying, we would like to have these four matrices give us the predictive ability to tell what's going to happen with this real world system. If you can't do that, you're not an engineer. Like, the whole purpose is to be able to predict, you know, future things based on things that you know now. Okay, so this is sort of a, this is a block diagram that control theorists draw that is essentially exactly the same as the math formulas we were just seeing, but it's supposed to drive home. We have this system that has a state inside. Maybe the state is, you know, the arm stuff and the pendulum angle and stuff. Um, there are some internal dynamics here, and there's a measurement equation. So every, everything about x, we don't necessarily know. All we get to see, everything, the only thing that comes out of the box is the measurements. So that's the pendulum block. There's some sort of controller block, i.e. the beagle bone, which is reading these outputs and is going to produce a sequence of inputs that goes into the block. Okay, so the whole, that's the whole idea in block diagram form. Now, I'm going to tell you about a controller scheme called state feedback control. And here's the idea. Suppose D was zero, the D matrix was zero, and the C matrix was the identity matrix, so that yi equals xi. In other words, yi equals xi, and the output is just the state, okay? A kind of controller, if that, that, what that means physically is, I have a sensor that can measure every single state here. I'm no longer confined to just reading the first element of the state and the third element of the state. I'm not confined to these two, I actually get to, be, get to read two and four as well. That's what C is the identity matrix means physically. You have a sensor for every state. So that means yi equals xi, and that means one type of controller that you could in principle implement is this kind, ui equals k times xi. So you pick some matrix k so that ui, and then, and so let me just tell you what that means. This, here's an example, ui equals k, this matrix, times xi. This is a weird matrix, right? It's just a row vector. Why does it have to be a row vector? Because this is a, because this is a four by one matrix, and this thing is a scalar. So whatever k is, the dimensions have to work out. This thing has to crush, the k has to crush this four vector into a single scalar. I know, x is a, I know u is a scalar because it's just a scalar voltage, right? So here is one potential k matrix that I could use for my system. One, zero, one, minus one. It's a one by four matrix. And what that means is what at the i, so suppose at time step i, I read these four specific values. Maybe this is like, you know, 20 degrees, 20, uh, 3 d radians per second, I'm mixing units, sorry, you know, like minus 10 radians uh, and, and 20 radians per second or something. So there's, suppose I measure four specific numbers um, from my system at this time step. What this control law says is take these four numbers, add the first one, add the first one, throw away the second one, add the third one, subtract the fourth one, right? That's what this matrix does to this 
vector. Yeah? And take that number, whatever you get, this is essentially just a weighted sum of these four numbers that you measured from your sensors, and apply that as a voltage to the system. Does that make sense? So it's like a very simple feedback law. You read these four, your, your four states, you add them together in some sort of weighted way, and then apply that as a, as a voltage. That's what state feedback control is. It's called state feedback because you're taking the state, the whole state, not some weird subset of the state, like only the first and third uh, components. The whole state is being fed back and then multiplied by some constant matrix and sent back to the system. Okay, so it's called a state feedback controller. And the thing about state feedback controllers is they're easy to design. I will show you how to compute a good K matrix. I don't think this is a good K matrix. Um, they're easy to analyze. I'll analyze them in the next slide. And they're really easy to implement. Why are they easy to implement? Because it's just four damn numbers that you've got to multiply by four things and then send it back to the system. So it's not like some sort of super complicated, you know, incredible integral thing or whatever. <laughs> like you just do it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this K matrix. Will this K matrix stabilize the system? So this is where you as a control engineer actually get to do a little bit of math to analyze the system, figure out, like this is, this is not just sort of shooting wildly in the dark. You can, for any K matrix, we're gonna see, does it actually work? So here's the idea. Just like before, we have this dynamical system, this just discrete time dynamical system. Suppose D equals zero and C is the identity matrix, so we get to measure the state exactly. Now by choosing this input, U equals KX, I just repeated it here. <clears throat> if you plug this U into this, uh, this data equation up here, then you get A plus BK. See that? The KX goes here, there's you got BKX. Okay, so this, the next value of the state is A plus BK times the previous value of the state. Where did the U go? Well, I plugged it in, so it's not there anymore, right? <laughs> okay, so, and so if you take this equation, so what this equation is saying is the next value of the state under this control law is just the previous value times this matrix. If you iterate back, so if you say, okay, well, what's xi? Well, there's another equation, xi equals a plus bk times xi minus one. What's xi minus one? It's a plus bk times xi minus two. I could go all the way back until I get xi equals a plus bk to the i, because every time I get a new factor, right, of a plus bk times the initial condition. So this is saying, whatever your initial condition was, Xi, I'm just gonna take this matrix and exponentiate it again and again and again and again and again, and that's, what, that's where I'm gonna end up. So it's like really important <laughs> that this matrix, if these were real numbers, and this number was like greater than one in absolute value, it would explode, right? And if this number is less than one in absolute value, it'll decay. So what this means in matrix terms is, I mean, it's the same idea in matrix terms. You would like to pick a K for which A plus BK to the I, when you crank up I, when you multiply it again and again and again, goes to the zero matrix. That's the whole idea behind state feedback control. Pick a K so that when you multiply the, state, the initial condition over and over and over again, this XI goes to zero. If XI goes to zero, that means these states go to zero, so the pendulum is like still up here. Does that make sense? Okay, so, uh, that's, uh, so that's the idea behind state feedback control. If you have a case, if somebody goes, walks up to you on the street, says, I have this matrix, uh, this dynamical system, A, B, C, D, I'm proposing to use this control law, K, what do you think about it? You could do A plus B, K and start raising it to higher and higher powers and see if it goes to zero or not. If it, goes, if it doesn't go all to zero, that means that some component of the state is gonna blow up and you can say, nope, too bad. That's not a good feed state feedback control law. Okay, so uh, that's how to, evaluate, how to analyze that K, that state feedback gain. But we still haven't a solved a very important question. How do you express the pendulum system, this physical system here, how do you get the A, B, C, and D? Well, we already know C. It's this like funny two by four matrix. We know D is zero because there's no way that this voltage is immediately going to affect the measured values. But how do you figure out A and B? And that's the last piece of the puzzle. So I will show you now 
if anybody takes, if anybody thinks this is at all interesting and takes ECE 147C, and by the way, you do not have to take A and B beforehand. I didn't. I was a mechanical engineer in undergrad and I took ECE 147C. Like, man, did I feel like a fish out of water. But it's still, I mean, it worked out and it was just like the coolest class I ever took. So like my point is like, uh, I'm not a genius and you do not have to be a genius <laughs> to, you know, to take ECE 147C, if, even if you haven't taken the previous ones. So don't worry about it. You will have a great time because you'll spend all your time with your lab mates banging your head against this physical system. Everybody gets, so this is the linear version of this rotational inverted pendulum. It uses the same sensors um, and instead of a crappy beagle bone, there's like, you know, they're running MATLAB and they have a nice user environment and stuff. Um, so they, it's a much nicer development to operate in. Um, yeah, and, and the only difference between these two things is this one moves back and forth and this one rotates, the arm rotates. But they, they still have the pendulum that swings from side to side. Okay, so here is how to figure out what the A and B matrices are. It's pretty straight, oh, okay, it's, it's weird. The first time you see it, it's weird. Um, I gotta be honest. So you start out by writing the equations of motion. So F equals MA. You write F equals MA, you essentially draw a free body diagram. I'm sure everybody's had physics at this point, so this is not a, uh, you know, this is not an incredible, I mean, it's hard to divide these, but everybody's heard of a free body diagram at least. So there's the cart. The cart has, you know, various forces acting on it. The pendulum has various for forces acting on it. This is F equals MA for the cart. So, so the sum of the forces equals the mass of the cart times the acceleration. This is tau equals I alpha, you know, like the uh, F equals MA, but for rotations. So this is the sum of the torques equals I times the angular acceleration. And these are the various forces. These forces, so the normal force, the, what is, I don't remember what P is, but this is the important one. This one comes from the force imposed on the cart by the motor. And there's just physics and trig going on here. This is, the v, this is the voltage that you're applying to the motor divided by the resistance of the motor, the coil, the motor, the, the motor coil volt uh, resistance. V over R, well that's current. The current that you're pumping through a DC motor is proportional to the torque that that motor is producing. And the torque that the motor is producing, because it's sort of on this funny linkage that slides back and forth, is just proportional to the force. So there's a couple of motor constants in here, but this is like a totally physical quantity. V over R is current, current's related to force. Okay, this thing here, the derivative of the position, this is how fast is the motor, uh, how fast is the cart sliding across the little rail? Um, that, you probably know, if you take a DC motor and you spin it by hand, it acts as a generator. Have you ever done this? This is like uh, kind of a cool thing to do. You can actually turn one DC motor with another one. If you hook them up together, you can actually like twist one and the other will move because you're using this one as a generator to drive a voltage through the other one. Um, you should totally do it. <laughs> if they're crappy DC motors, like the ones that I showed you a picture of, you can barely even feel the other one move because it's so lossy. Um, but you can feel it sort of twitch a little bit when you crank it real hard. You might need a friend for this. It's sort of a trust exercise for engineers. <laughs> okay, but my point is, what was my point? There's the, the, uh, the, the velocity of the cart moving along is pumping energy back against the motor. It's causing, essentially it's inducing a back EMF, a back electromotive force that's slowing down, that's less decreasing the force that the motor is able to produce. So anyway, so these are two physical quantities. Um, and then there's a bunch of sines and cosines that come from various angles of the pendulum and so on. It's really crappy. Okay. But you plug these forces into F equals MA and you get these equations of motion. So do not memorize these <laughs> because it's awful. But the whole point is there are some things here like P and V and P dot and theta, which are time varying that will change over time. And there are some things like the mass of the pendulum or the mass of the pendulum, the length of the pendulum, gravity at like 9.8. You know, there are some things that are constant that will not change. So half of the battle here is just figuring out what, to, what are like your actual variables and what are just the constants. And a lot of the constants you can just get from a data sheet or a physical constant. So the core idea behind figuring out how to turn these dynamics, these real world dynamics into something that you can compute with is express the dynamics, the equations of the system as a discrete time, linear time invariant system as this system here. In other words, find A, B, C, and D. We already know what C and D are, so it's just all about A and B. And then find the K matrix that drives this thing to zero. Okay, um, because then we'll use this state feedback control law. So that is the whole idea behind what we're trying to do right now. Okay, so let's just, first let's just simplify it. So like, 
there's all these constants here, and it's going to melt our brains if I have to look at them. So I'm going to just make them all one or something. Okay, I'm just going to go through this. Like this is conceptually what we're going to do. The only things that we care about are p. You know, where's the cart? Where's the pendulum? What voltage are you applying? Um, so if you just throw away all the constants, you get this equation. And I don't even want to deal with the theta double dot equation. This is just like dot dot. You know, blah blah. I don't care about this. So here is the uh, the the first equation here, and Let's see, has anyone, do you know how to convert an nth order differential equation into a vector first order differential equation? Have you seen this before? Sort of, right? So the idea here is, let's see, you have a double dot, p double dot, and you would like to express it as a vector equation. Instead of just a single equation with multiple derivatives, express it as a vector equation where everything, where every derivative only appears once. So what does that mean? Have x, define x dot to be this thing. This is what we've been doing so far. So then x dot is p dot, p double dot, theta dot, theta double dot. And then p, double, p dot is just here, theta dot is just here. p double dot, well, that comes from this big old equation up here. Plug that thing in, and then I don't care about theta double dot because it's too complicated. OK, so once you have this, all of these things can be expressed back as the x's again. The x's and the u, right? The v, the voltage that you're applying is just, that's what we're calling u in sort of the canonical form. So this thing is a vector first order differential equation because it's x dot. There's one derivative here, and there's all the other uh, components of x. So let's call this thing f of x. The u here we just pull out, OK? And so x prime is f of x plus and then this little vector in u. Does that make sense? OK. He had to go. He knew that he told me ahead of time. <laughs> See you back in the lab. Yeah, thanks. So, so at this point, we, all we've done is we've expressed the dynamics in this vector form. So x is a vector now. OK, nobody gets hurt. Next, this is the last step. We will just linearize this, because we're trying to get a linear differential equation. So I stole this from Wikipedia. If you have a multidimensional function f of x, a multi, sorry, multivariable function f of x, and you want to uh, linearize it, what does that mean? It's like imagine you have a parabola, and you want to approximate that parabola at like x equals 10. So you go up, you look where the parabola is, you say, OK, well, my line should go through wherever the parabola is at x equals 10, but then it should also have a slope that matches the parabola's slope. Does this seem plausible? Does this seem like maybe something you've seen before? So in other words, f of x, the parabola, approximated at x equals 10 is whatever you, know, you evaluated at 10, and then it's like plus like mx plus b kind of thing. So this is the slope of the parabola, and then this is x minus the point. So as you deviate away from that 10, you're going to move in accordance with the slope of the parabola evaluated at that point. OK, so the only difference here, so have you, I'm assuming you guys have seen Jacobians in like uh, your calculus class. So you essentially take the Jacobian or the gradient or whatever. Um, and so this is f of x. Do not take derivatives by hand. There are computers for this. So you plug this into Mathematica. <laughs> it takes the gradient for you. You plug in this point, this uh, equilibrium point, this, this 0, 0, 0, 0 thing, and you get a numeric answer. So that is how you compute the A matrix. This is, so sorry, I skipped ahead. So this is how you compute the Jacobian, and you plug in the P. So this is, this is grad F evaluated at P. Here's grad F. It's symbolic. Mathematica did that for you. Um, and then you evaluate it at P. That's this 0, 0, 0, 0 thing. OK. So this matrix is going to turn out to be the A matrix. So we wanted, to ev we wanted to linearize this weird function F about this point P here. So F of x is approximately this thing here. We took the gradient at P. And so x, x dot equals F of x plus this funny thing with u. F of x is approximately this matrix. <clears throat> times x, and so we have approximately ax plus bu. So that's the deal. That is, uh, we've now expressed the dynamic, and these, the, all these numbers here are crucially dependent on the dynamics of the system that we calculated before. OK, so our core idea was take the dynamics of the system and crunch, 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 simplify, linearize, eventually get down to ax plus bu. Um, and so now we actually have an a and a b. And sorry, this one should be here. I noticed that too late. OK, so we have an A and B. We have the C and the D from before. And now we are ready to find this K. OK, A, B, C, D. We actually have, this is so exciting, we have matrices that should predict what this system will do um, in the real world when we apply some voltage. I mean, like, that would be very cool if that was actually the case. Now, the only thing we have to do in order to make this that thing actually a controller is figure out the K matrix. 
And the K matrix is just those four numbers, one, two, three, four, right? One, zero, one, minus one, or whatever. Like, how do you pick a good one? Find the K matrix. There's a MATLAB function for this. Okay, so like, you guys have been here for a long time, so I'm not gonna keep you here a lot longer, but so there's a MATLAB function called place. You essentially tell it, you know, the A matrix, the B matrix, and where do you want your, the poles of your closed loop transfer function? Has anybody taken a controls class or like a linear systems class? Who's heard of poles? I'm not gonna quiz you. Who's heard of poles or transfer functions? I mean, I'm like totally winded. I'm so out of shape. <laughs> okay, so, so you pretty much tell MATLAB, you will get to this. I promise you will get to this. Uh, you tell MATLAB how, where, where do you want, how fast do you want your, system, your controller to be, and it will tell you, based on your A and your B and how fast you want the controller to be, the more negative means more fast, um, here is the K matrix you should use. So there's a function for this. I'm sorry I won't go into detail because it's real late and you guys are very patient, but that's the whole idea. Our original idea, our original problem was we want to make a state space controller, a state feedback controller for the system, but we, how do we take the physics of the system and turn it into a discrete time system? We talked about it, we, you linearize it. How do you find the K matrix? Ask MATLAB. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the idea. And just to sort of tie it all together, this is the crucial piece of code that is running on the beagle bone. There is this K matrix. It's defined as a numpy array. Numpy is like a linear, assist, a linear a numerical package for MATLAB. And this is one, two, and there's two other elements. I didn't show you all of them because I don't want you to cheat on ECE-147C. <laughs> no. But no, this, so this is your K matrix, and you essentially multiply it by, you know, this is KX, the K matrix times the state of the system. And that's what you write out as the motor voltage. So that is what is going on in this beagle bone. Okay, now, in conclusion, we took the equations of motion, we converted it to a vector first order equation, nothing was lost there, that was just rearranging, that was just doing algebra. Linear, linearizing the system um, is where we start to make an approximation, because f of x is only approximately, uh, you know, essentially the gradient times x, um, and that allowed us to compute the state feedback gain using MATLAB's place function. Some things that we did not talk about, because it's really late, I appreciate it, is how we started with continuous time dynamics and we ended up with a discrete time system. Um, there is a little bit of careful finagling that you need to do in order to convert a continuous time system that evolves in continuous time to a discrete time system that updates only, say, every five milliseconds that we didn't get to because of time constraints. Another thing that we did not talk about, but that Kayo pointed out, is that if you're only measuring two components of your four component state, how can you get the other two? We were only measuring the two angles, not the derivatives of the angles. What do you do about that? Well, there are various ways of getting around it. Um, you, can, you can construct numerically what's called a dirty differentiator. Um, I don't want to see anyone in Isla Vista doing the dirty differentiator. Don't make that into like the next dance that everybody does or something. So there's a thing called a dirty differentiator that will approximate uh, the derivative, um, but it amplifies noise. There is another way of doing it using a Kalman filter. And uh, about a year ago, I gave a talk on the Kalman filter, so, and I put it on YouTube. So if anybody wants to see my talk on the Kalman filter, uh, it's about as crazy as this one, um, but, uh, and that's my username. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, you take, uh, you, not all of the people taking EC-147C are that handsome, so don't get your hopes up, <laughs> but this is, running, this is it running on MATLAB, essentially the same algorithm. But what is different is this algorithm changes the set point. It is not just trying to keep it here the whole time, but it tries to, it tries to keep it here for a while, and then 10, 10 sec seconds later, shift it over by a couple of feet. And then 10 seconds later, shift it over. And I want you to notice something interesting. When it's gonna move this way, it first moves that way. Watch, whoa, see that? Okay, so like, um, and then it sort of stabilizes out. Now this is what is absolutely magical. I never said in the entire last hour that if you want it to move this way, you first have to have it jolt the other way. You know, you would expect that to get this behavior, all the undergrads in EC-147C would have to say, if you want the pendulum to move this way, first you have to move that way so that the pendulum begins falling this way, and then you can actually move it over. That's what it's doing, right? But nowhere did we actually see that tonight. I didn't say anything about having to actually hard code that in. That weird behavior where it knows to move this way so that it begins falling, and then it can move this way far faster, all you get for free. It comes out of the physics and out of the control theory. And that is what I think is the coolest part about control theory. You get all sorts of weird physical behavior for free just by knowing the math. Whew. Okay, so in conclusion, we did a demo. It was, a co it was okay. We talked about the pendulum. <laughs> 
We talked about the beagle bone. It's a pretty cool thing. I think like I, I would, it would be neat to talk to people about the beagle bone. I don't know if there's like a beagle bone users group here or something, but I have to use it for my research. I'd be happy to talk with people about it. And we talked about control theory, and that was kind of a slog, and I'm sorry about that, but that's, got to be honest, that's what control theory is all about. But it gets easier. Like you see, it's the same tricks. Oh, linearize it, discretize it. Linearize it, discretize it. That's sort of all you do in control theory. Find the K matrix. Okay, the last, this is the last slide. The, this is why I'm really excited about using this beagle bone to drive the system. This is five grand um, for the pendulum, the, how, what is this thing called? A universal power module. This comes from a company called Kwanzer. They, uh, they totally ream universities because they're like, they got, they cornered the market on these inverted pendulum systems. So you get the, part, uh, the pendulum hardware, the universal power module, this giant, super overpowered amplifier. I mean, you could do that with this tiny little motor driver. Why do you need a huge box? It's like the size of a shoebox. Okay. You need the DAC board in order to read. This is this thing here. This reads like, this is what you jam the cables into. This thing plugs into the desktop computer with an IO card that's also extra. And and then, how do you use it on the computer? Well, you've got to have MATLAB. That's three grand for a corporate license. Simulink also, that's another two grand <laughs> for a corporate license. You students get it for free because they got to like hook you when you're young, you know what I mean? Okay, and then on top of that, you got to buy these like specialized Simulink blocks that you can use in Simulink to, to drive the hardware. So this is like a big expense, right? Like, you don't need all this stuff to like be excited about control theory and to make stuff work in the real world. Like, what do you need? Like a motor driver, a beagle bone, and know how to program Python. You do need the pendulum hardware, which is like one to two grand, but um, Lego Mindstorms has an inverted pendulum setup that is also really cheap. Um, so like this market is just like exploding. Like people love the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone and the Arduino. And even companies like MATLAB and Mathematica are trying to figure out how they can patch their, you know, patch their systems so that you can like, for instance, <laughs> deploy code onto a Raspberry Pi or onto a BeagleBone from Simulink or whatever. But if you know Python or C or C++, like you can just do it directly. Anyway, so. That was the profit part. We didn't, we didn't, um, I said, you know, this plus this plus this equals profit. I think the profit might come from like saving money. Like you don't have to spend five grand in order to do this. So sorry, that's sort of a weaselly way to, you know, it's not profit per se, it's just the absence of loss. <laughs> so, um, Please, if you are going to work on the Beagle Bone, please get this book because you will spend so much time, waste so much time on the internet finding other clueless people's solutions. Um, if you get, the Beagle Bone software changes so fast that like, that somebody's solution might not work you know, later. But if you get a book, Derek, D the author of this book, says I'm using this version of the BeagleBone with this version of the Linux kernel and here's all my code. So you get that and it works. Like it all just works and he explains everything. Um, Andrew Symington helped me as a, now a postdoc, sorry, is now a researcher at NASA Ames. Kayo is right there. He helped me figure out uh, a bunch of stuff about the BeagleBone. And Calvin is right there, and he helps me a lot with uh, doing some research over the summer involving the BeagleBones. Um, and a lot of really cool real-time stuff um, in case you are nervous that your Python code is going to get preempted by Linux and actually put your control system, your control loop to sleep for a couple of milliseconds. If you're driving something that's not like a super slow motor, that could actually have real consequences for you. If only there were some sort of real-time interface that would guarantee that, the, that your control loop will run precisely. That's what, that's what we've been working on. I'm happy to talk with you about that later. And the uh, Santa Barbara Electronics Supply is a great place to go. Um, these guys offer me a lot of help and they're off uh, Magnolia on Hollister. Cool. So thanks.